Thank you, Sister Bethany, and thank you to the Council of Major Superiors of Women Religious. Yes, I got that one. <laughs> I've been practicing all day. Um, for inviting me here to speak at the first Given Conference. I am truly thrilled and honored to be here um, to be able to share with you the gift of our God-given temperament with all of you lovely, young Catholic leaders. Um, and my hope is that this talk will give you even more appreciation for this gift, as well as some handy tools in your toolbox for dealing with coworkers, family members, friends, future spouse or spouse, and future children, if you don't have any children yet. Um, but first, I'd like to start with <clears throat> a prayer to the Blessed Mother. Let's start with the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for praying with me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to give away, I only have one book to give away. Um, this is our te The Temperament God Gave Your Kids, and this was actually the last of our temperament books. So it's actually the best written, you know, because as you get going, you get better at it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, does anybody, I know most of you are probably single, but are, are, is there, are there any, raise your hand if you have children. Okay, we've got some with children. Okay, anybody with, you were, you were on the ball. You were like right up there on the first. <laughs> I, should, yeah, I think I'm going to have to give it to her for being the first. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, for being the first to raise her hand. <laughs> okay, you've got kids though, right? Then you, you, how many? Two, awesome. Well, you can use this. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I should have brought more. There you go. <laughs> oh. I know, usually I, yeah, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> okay, well, be, before I start telling you about temperament, okay, I have a confession to make. Um, before I knew about temperament, I used to think that my husband, Art, was just like me, only bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I learned about temperament, and I discovered that some of the things that he would do that I thought he was doing to purposefully annoy me and harass me, actually these things were part of his God-given temperament. So there, for example, like he just would come home and he didn't feel like talking. Well, I thought he was mad at me or perhaps he's antisocial, I don't know. Anyway, but it turns out that's part of his temperament. And then he discovered about me that when I like to argue about everything, it doesn't mean that I'm mad at him. It's actually that that's the way I process information. But anyway, so I discovered this about temperament, and it was extremely helpful for our marriage and also helpful for in raising kids. And, um, and this really is the real reason to understand temperament. It's not so that you can learn how to label all your friends and your coworkers and your family members um, or put them in a box you know, or become a temperament bully. That's just the way I am, girlfriend. No, okay. It's actually because you want to understand yourself and others, and you want to be more accepting of them, more understanding, and also more forgiving. Um, and also, crucially, you learn that what might mean love to you does not mean love to the other person. So it's kind of like a product of, oops, original sin, um, that we tend to think that what pleases me will please you. Um, and we can go through a relationship for a long time and not realize that, you know what, that, that didn't please them at all. And so understanding temperament really helps in this regard. And ultimately, our primary vocation, whether we're called to be married or single or consecrated religious, is to love. And the way we are called to love is shown to us by Christ, he says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And more specifically, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And when we understand temperament, we, we learn how we can lay down our lives in very small ways, 
but in very consistent small ways for other people because we learn what counts as love for them. And we, become, we also become more forgiving because we realize a lot of times that oh, when, when I thought that other person was doing something, you know, was being mean to me, um, they weren't being mean. It was something just their temperament talking. Um, and also, it's very important to understand ourselves. And uh, Father William Faber, uh, he's the, Frederick William Faber is actually his name, he wrote uh, some of the most beautiful hymns, uh, like Jesus, my Lord, my God, my all. He wrote that. Well, he, he did these awesome spiritual conferences, and one of them really struck me. He said, um, he goes, everybody has this little dark corner in our soul that we don't want to shine the light in. And that's one of the reasons to understand temperament, because when we really get to know ourselves, we're shining the light there, and then we become more aware of God's mercy to us, and we become more merciful to other people. So what is temperament? Okay, it's not the whole of our personality. Okay, if you think of the whole of your personality as a big umbrella, okay, and in this umbrella, there's various things. There's the environment, there's your culture that you grew up in, there's perhaps your family of origin, like, you know, you're raised, you know, do you have, six, are there six siblings, are there ten, are there only, is there only one, or whatever. Um, there's, um, where did you go to school? All these are environmental aspects that impact your total personality. Um, and then there's also, uh, there's, there's your own free will, your own choices that you make, that ultimately shapes your personality as well. So, but then there's also, under this umbrella, which all of this is contributing to your total personality, all, there's also temperament. And that is the nature part as opposed to the nurture part. So it's actually kind of the way God sort of gives us a little kickstart to start us off. And everybody who has children has probably already noticed that they, they don't come into the world like a blank sheet of wax, you know, ready to be written on by the environment. No, they actually start out with their own little bits of personality. So, so temperament is that part of us that we are born with. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like a kind of a snapshot, a brief snapshot of the four temperaments. Um, and now we call them the four temperaments in our book, books, primarily because they are, we're kind of following along in a tradition, the Catholic tradition, where there's a long history of saints and popes and spiritual writers who have used this terminology that we use. So we talk about the four temperaments. Now th that doesn't mean that there really is such a thing as the, we say choleric or choleric, phlegmatic, uh, melancholic, and the sanguine. And we use this, these categories because we're, as I said, following in this tradition. And, um, and also, because it's a handy kind of a tool. So if you were studying psychology, you're not going to study these specific temperaments, but you will be studying the concept of temperament and also these particular types of characteristics, which we are then grouping together in these four boxes. But we're not going to put you in a box, don't worry. Um, the idea here is that you're probably going to recognize one of these or two as kind of your primary you, you will recognize that, yeah, that does sound like me, you know, and that's probably your primary and maybe your secondary. Now, did anybody get to take the temperament quiz, temperamentquiz.com? That, yeah, it's online. Yeah, some of you did. So you probably already have an idea of what your temperament is. So I'm going to go through kind of presenting this kind of a snapshot of the, of the four, and then you guys can figure out where you fit in with, with those. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the choleric, now or choleric. Some people say. Anyway, the choleric is your original type A personality. They have quick, intense reactions, which makes them decisive, tenacious, and driven to follow through. They're determined, energetic, forceful, and confident. Now, what you want to remember about cholerics is that they love to be in charge. 
and they don't have to have any actual experience in the areas in which they decide to take charge. I, I, I see some people are pointing already, you know, it's like they, that's like, that's you over there. There's a cleric over there. Okay. Well, loved, I love to use the example of Mother Angelica, and she's described in the book by Raymond Arroyo as a cleric. She clearly, clearly is. Um, and she, you know, as everybody knows, she did all this, the EWTN, without any experience in this at all. Um, so one of the stories that he tells in the book is um, about when she was, bless you, um, <laughs> when she was just starting up her, the convent in Alabama, I guess is, uh, it, this is when it was, she, she was looking for ways to raise money. So um, she's like, what can I do? Okay, well, she's got a few of these nuns here. She's, she lines them all up in an assembly line, and uh, she says, okay, we are going to make fishing lures. Okay, and she gets, well, one, one sister has the, the, the bait, and another one has the hooks, and another one has the feathers, you know, or whatever. You know, somebody else packages them. Anyway, so they have this little assembly line going, and they're making, this, you know, these fishing lures. And lo and behold, these fishing lures became the hottest item, you know, in, in fishermen, you know, in the fishermen's world that year. So she was actually... Oh, she called them St. Peter's fishing lures, which is really cute. Um, anyway, so she was actually featured on, in Sports Illustrated magazine this year for having the best-selling fishing lures in the country. And all of this, of course, despite the fact that she never fished a day in her life. <laughs> but she was cleric, so that doesn't... <laughs> yep. <laughs> so clerics are... Fiercely independent, self-motivated, and strong-willed. They're sometimes accused of rolling over people once they've set a plan in motion, of being stubborn and demanding, opinionated, competitive, and argumentative. Now, you'll know you're a cleric if that doesn't bother you. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. <laughs> So my, for example, my, my youngest daughter, Lucy, she allows me, in, in fact she demands that I um, use her name when, <laughs> when giving talks, and she's a choleric like I am. So um, th thankfully we didn't have a choleric firstborn because then we'd probably be terrified. But anyway, so by the end of, you know, so the youngest child is a choleric, and um, she was about, she was, I can't remember how old she was, about 12 or 13 at, at the time, and she, um, we were working on, the, the temperament creating a test, a new test for the kid book that I just handed out over there. Um, so I, it, it, we had it divided up between strengths and weaknesses. So we had, so I had a list of strengths and a list of weaknesses, and I was having her, you know, take this test. And and then she goes, "Wait a minute, Mom, I don't understand this. You have always right in the weakness category." <laughs> <laughs> Clerics, clerics are always right. <laughs> also, so both, so we're both clerics, and we have a lot of arguments together, uh, debates. I mean, we like to, you know, that's what we like to do. Anyway, um, so one one day she was she was about twelve at the time again, and she was she was looking in the mirror, and um, and she suddenly she stops and she goes, "Mom, there's something." wrong with the shape of my head. And I said, Lucy, there's nothing wrong with the shape of your head. Your head's just fine. She goes, no. There's something seriously wrong with the shape of my head. Look, it goes, it's round. It's round behind my ears. And of course, we're off and running on our debate, right? So I go, Lucy, <laughs> your head is supposed to be round behind your ears. If your head, let me consider this. If your head was not round behind your ears, if it went straight back like this, <laughs> you'd be a Martian. <laughs> so there. And Lucy goes, Mom, a, a Martian doesn't look like that. What are you talking about? A Martian's head goes like this. It goes straight up 
and then there's a big ball at the top, like that. That's what Martians look like. I go, Lucy, I am not talking about those Martians. I'm talking about the other Martians, the Martians whose heads go straight back like that. <laughs> Meanwhile, our, one of our sons was standing there, and he goes, I cannot believe you two are arguing about Martians. <laughs> Neither of you has ever seen a Martian. <laughs> but of course, that doesn't matter to the choleric, because we were enjoying our argument. <laughs> St. Paul himself was probably a choleric. In Athens, Paul grows exasperated by all the idols. Quote, so he debated in the synagogue with the Jews and the worshipers, and daily in the public square, with whoever happened to be there. <laughs> Paul even disagreed openly with Peter, the first pope. Quote, I opposed him to his face because he clearly was wrong. <laughs> In Acts, it says about Paul, quote, he even addressed the Greek-speaking Jews and debated with them. They, for their part, responded by trying to kill him. <laughs> Choleric sometimes provoke that kind of response. <laughs> so the fact is, clerics can stir up arguments almost in their sleep. And for those of you who are in a relationship, perhaps, and maybe with engaged or married, and perhaps one of them, you, I mean, you might even be engaged to a, a, a cleric. This is a really important thing to keep in mind. And the experts in marriage research have actually shown that it's not disagreements themselves that cause problems for marriage. And as Pope Francis likes to point out, he said, quote, dear couples, even though the plates may fly, <clears throat> don't go to bed without making peace. So we like to say don't take it too personally when cholerics, young and old, want to argue or debate. And bear in mind that they typically don't like any idea unless it's their own. So if you are a cleric and, and you want to become a better friend or spouse or future spouse, virtues to try to gain, and these are going to be the things that are most tough for you. This is often telling, like you can figure out your temperament by what are the virtues that are the most difficult to attain. And virtues that are tough, but the ones you really want to work on, would be humility, docility, and patience. And also uh, compassion. Compassion, I like to throw that in. <laughs> it's important. Anyway, these don't come naturally to us. And um, on the docility ang angle, well, see, we, we don't like to take direction from anybody, but we need to learn how to do that, and that is actually key. So it's really crucial to have an, a strong interior life, a tr strong prayer life, so that you are taking direction from God. I mean, that would be the best thing, <laughs> to be really um, docile to your spiritual directors or docile to your, your, your pastor or whoever you go to, um, to to ask advice in the spiritual realm. Um, and it, it's hard. So another thing is with other people. It's also hard to take direction from other people. And there's a communication habit in our, that we describe in our second book, The Temperament God Gave Your Spouse, um, and it's called Being Open to Influence. And this requires humility and docility. And clerics don't like to be open to influence because they like to say, well, my idea is if you just do what I say, everything would run smoothly, you know? But we have to every once in a while listen to other people and take their advice. And it really re involves respecting the other person's thoughts and feelings. And this helps to build strong relationships and happy marriages. Now, you don't have to agree with what the other person is saying. You simply remain open to hearing what he's saying or feeling. And this is being respectful. Instead of saying, well, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, uh, you say, let me hear your thoughts on that. And, or tell me why that this is important to you. And this opens up the conversation for dialogue. Oh, one of my favorite sanguines is in the house. Sanguine in the house! <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll get to that. You, you, okay, we'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so let me give you an example of how I blow it, and I blow it many times, but um, fortunately my husband's a psychologist, so he knows how to handle these things. But anyway, he, um, so a few years ago, out of the blue, Art says he wants to go backpacking in the wilderness. 
the kind where you get dropped by a helicopter on the top of a mountain and then you have to like navigate your way out using the stars, right? And I immediately said, being the supportive wife that I am, I said, that's insane. <laughs> now, if you know my husband, you will know that that was the truth. <laughs> the last time we went camping, we couldn't get the coffee to boil on the, the Coleman stove, so we like left the kids in the tent and drove away and found a Starbucks. <laughs> anyway, but that was a real, you know, that was a real buzzkill. So I said, <laughs> what I should have said was, well, tell me more about that, or why is this important to you? And then we would have had some discussion, open it up for dialogue. Well, the beauty and the gift of the choleric temperament is really your enthusiasm, zeal, magnanimity, and your strong will. Once you grow in the virtues of compassion, patience, docility, and humility, you will actually be a great leader for your family, your community, and for Christ. Now, the exact opposite temperament to the choleric is the phlegmatic. What a great guy is what you often hear about a phlegmatic. They're the easygoing, soft-spoken, peaceful people that everybody loves to be around. Now remember we were talking about reaction, like the, the tendency to react in a certain way, um, so that where the choleric is intense and immediate and long-lasting reaction. The phlegmatic is just the opposite, not intense, not immediate, not long-lasting. So they're very even-keeled, like that. That makes them so wonderful to be around. Even in the middle of a conflict, they can be very, very, um, very even-keeled. So that actually makes them really good um, firemen, diplomats, military officers. We often find phlegmatics in those fields. Um, as children, they're quiet, docile, and obedient. And that's why we always say every family needs at least one phlegmatic. You know, keep, keep trying until you have a phlegmatic. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to have one. It's just, I mean, they're, they're awesome. Except every once in a while, we used to, oh, I forgot to mention, we have one of each temperament. So this is how we know all about temperaments. <laughs> you know? um, but our phlegmatic child would be this, like, sweet, you know, quiet one who we just would forget about. We'd, like, leave the store, and we'd be, wait a minute, where's Ray? Oh, he's back there. He's still at the store quietly playing with whatever. He's, you know, <laughs> not making a fuss. <laughs> A hallmark of phlegmatics is that they hate stirring up trouble, and they're easy to please. They're very happy with the way things are, and they don't want to go to the trouble of changing things. Clerics like to point out that, to phlegmatics that if, if we, everything had been left to phlegmatics, we would still be living in caves. Okay. Our oldest son, when he was in college, he was, um, this is quite a while back, but when he, he was rooming with another phlegmatic, and I was worried that they wouldn't eat at all. You know, I, I, I actually thought they were living on beer and maybe pretzels, you know. So I asked him, I said, you know, you guys are eating, aren't you? You know, are you having, are you cooking? And, and he goes, oh, yeah, no problem. Actually, it turns out my roommate Marco, he's actually a gourmet cook. I'm like, what, really? What does he do? And, and Ray goes, he goes, he goes, yeah, just last night, he fried the hot dogs. <laughs> anyway. Oh, boy. Anyway. <laughs> so phlegmatics are just the exact opposite of the choleric. So they are the peacemakers. They, they hate conflict, especially interpersonal conflict. You know, the choleric loves the argument, the phlegmatic hates the arguments. Um, in fact, he may, the phlegmatic may not even tell you uh, what he's really thinking. So if you have a friend who's a phlegmatic, they may be say, they're the ones who say, well, I don't care, whatever you want to do, it's fine. You know, you, go, you decide. And, but, you know, inside, you, you have to draw them out. So if you have a friend who's a phlegmatic, um, you keep drawing them out, you know, keep seeing what they really do want to do. Because inside, you know, maybe after a while, that could get really annoying if, they, you know, the cleric is like bullying them around all the time, you know. And the cleric loves having the phlegmatic friend because he's always telling them what to do, you know, and they're always like, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
and, and like I had, like I was giving this talk once, and this this girl comes up afterwards. She goes, "I'm not really sure what my temperament is," and I said, "You're phlegmatic." She goes, "Thank you." <laughs> I'm like, well, now I know what you are. <laughs> you know, I would. That was just like I was just throwing that out there, see if it would stick. You know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so sometimes they're accused of, of being wishy-washy, indecisive, slow, or boring. And this is not true. It's just that it takes them a longer time to respond. So, for example, one time Art and I went to the movies. How are we doing on time? Is that how much time I have left or how much time I've done? Okay, so, okay, good, I think. <laughs> okay, anyway, so we're at a movie and... Um, we're, we're walking home and, and, or walking back to the parking lot, and, and I said, I said, Art, what did you think about that movie? And he's like, oh, because he's part, I forgot to tell you, he's phlegmatic. Okay. <laughs> so he goes, um, oh, yeah, hmm, I don't know. Well, maybe, let me think about, I said, well, what about the, what about the music? You know, did you think the music actually went with the, was the music? I don't know. And it, what about Denzel Washington in that role? Wasn't he awesome in that role? I mean, that is one of his best. And the script was awesome, I said. I mean, honestly, that was a really good... I don't know about the, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the woman in the... I don't know if that really worked as well. But, um, you know, it's not, it's, and he's like, uh, wait, did you say there was music in there? <laughs> and then, I don't recall. The Let me think. Anyway, so we go home, you know, we go to bed, and we get up in the next morning, and Art has his coffee, and he goes, all of a sudden, it comes clear to him the next day. He's like, Lorraine, you know that movie we saw? And I go, what movie? <laughs> Ship has sailed. <laughs> you know, so, anyway, so because they often let others take the lead, and they tend to move more slowly on things, they can get lost in the shuffle. Sometimes the phlegmatic can suffer from a little bit of the lowered self-esteem because they're used to, like, throughout their whole life, they've always been like, okay, whatever you guys want to do, or we're always keeping the peace, or whatever, and they're not, like, really standing out there, and they're not raising their hand in class, and, and so they can get overlooked. And it can, like, cause a little bit of a, a damage to your self-esteem. So. It's like you want to really work on that and really find your passion. If you're a phlegmatic, you know, really work on that. Work on getting yourself out there, and um, and and friends and can also be encouraging to their phlegmatic friends. Um, so virtues for the phlegmatic, really courage, you know, to speak up, because Christ didn't always turn the other cheek. Sometimes he turned over the tables. So that's something that the phlegmatics need. To remember, to keep that in mind. Um, courage, supernatural confidence for the times where you feel like you, you know you're you're not you feel like you're being overlooked or whatever. You need supernatural confidence. You know, put your trust in God and just take that step out there. And holy audacity. Those are great virtues for phleg phlegmatics. Now, the cross for a phlegmatic can be speaking up or taking charge of a situation. If you have the opportunity, if you're a, a phlegmatic. You know, and take, you have the opportunity to be a leader, then you should definitely step up and take that challenge. Because phlegmatics can often be the best leaders. You know, you think, you think of the choleric as the natural leader, but the phlegmatic can be the servant leader. Um, because with their natural virtues of getting along with everybody, their willingness to serve, and their, their talent for di diplomacy, their peacemaking abilities, well, these are all wonderful qualities in a servant leader. Okay, the next temperament is the sanguine. Okay, the sanguine is your classic people person, okay? The life of the party, fun-loving and affectionate. Now, remember we talked about reactions. So the sanguine has similar reactions to the choleric in that they're very extroverted, for one, but they have intense reactions, very quick reactions, but they're not long-lived. Okay, so they are eager to please, they love to be the center of attention, they live in the present moment, and, but also because of that quickness to forget, they tend to be very interested, very optimistic, they take on new projects, but then they forget. So um, they arrive late, they forget their car keys, 
and even where they parked their car. But they always have a funny story to tell you about why they were late, so you forgive them. <laughs> A sanguine child is the one who's always running out, out the door and, and they forgot their, and then they have to come back in, you know, ten times because they forgot their homework, they forgot their keys, they forgot, or whatever, they forgot their permission slip from the parent, or they forgot their shoes, you know, they, they're very forgetful, okay, it doesn't mean they're ADHD, they're just, this is part of the natural temperament, that they tend to have these short-lived reactions. They love people and they love being sociable. The sanguine enjoys life, where the choleric might want to conquer life. You know, the sanguine enjoys life. They have lots of friends, lots of activities. They're sociable, spontaneous, and scattered. They're kind of like butterflies. They flit from flower to flower to flower. So in school, they join lots of club, clubs, but then they forget to attend. <coughs> we have our, our, third, our third son, went one year when he was in high school, he signed up for every club. We're like, and, but then he never attended any of them. <laughs> then, at the end of the year, I'm looking in the yearbook, and there he is, like, math club? No <laughs> way. Wait, you don't, you do not play the violin. I know you don't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's over here. He's in every single, he's, he's like, he goes, hey, I showed up on picture day. <laughs> you know, that's what counts. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, so... Um, recently, we had our annual women's conference, um, and this is awesome. It's like wonderful. We had 700 to, I don't know, lots and lots of ladies. Um, once a year, we have this huge, huge, huge conference. Great talks, confession. There's like, you know, 20 priests, and it's just, it's, it's really great. And I look forward to it every year because I get to see all the people that I didn't see for a whole year. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all these people. And... Um, Oh, and I'm part sanguine. I forgot to tell you that. Okay, so part sanguine. And um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing all the friends that I haven't seen in a long time. And I'm, I actually volunteer to, um, sanguines like to volunteer. They sometimes forget, but they like to volunteer. Um, and so I volunteered to get there really early, 6.30 in the morning, and um, help with the registration. So I am so excited. I'm in my happy place. You know, I've got my friend Beth. She's also a sanguine. She's there. She's like, we're, we got our seats together at the registration table. We're sitting there. We're like so excited. We're going to say hi to everybody that, that we have. Oh, hey, Jane, I haven't seen you in so long. This is so great. I just love this. Anyway, so we're really excited. And then the, the woman who is putting on the conference, she comes up to me. She goes, Lorraine. I need you to go help at the confession line. And I'm like, no! <laughs> I mean, I was scared. And, I mean, I love confession. It's, I have nothing against confession. I love confession. I love that they have 20 priests and all this kind of stuff. But the confession line was upstairs and it was quiet. <laughs> and nobody was talking. And all my friends are down there talking, I could hear, I could hear them. They're, they're like talking, and they're having their coffee, and eating their bagels, and their croissants. And I'm like, the confession line. <laughs> to be quiet, quiet, to be quiet. Okay, Father, Father Brian is open over here. It's like, this is a job for the melancholics. Why did she ask me this? <laughs> Just like, but I offered it up. It was during Lent, so I offered it up. Anyway, <laughs> but I came home and I told my husband Art about it, and he goes, oh, I would have loved the confession line. <laughs> Gosh. St. Peter was a lovable but inconstant sanguine. Quote, Lord, I'm prepared to go to prison and to die with you, he fervently pronounces. And a few hours later, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. At the Transfiguration, Peter enthusiastically offers to set up three tents on the spot. Even though, as scripture notes, he did not know what he was saying. <laughs> when Christ appears walking on the water, Peter impulsively joins him until he begins to sink. <laughs> Sanguines are wonderfully generous, 
open and forgiving until the going gets tough. That's when the sanguine goes shopping. Remember St. Peter trying to talk Christ out of the cross? <laughs> no, not the cross. No, not the confession line. You know, <laughs> it's classic. Anyway, um, so virtues that may be more challenging for sanguines, perseverance, especially with boring things, self-control, and what's called lack of human respect. That's, that's a tough one because sanguines really want to please other people. They really like other people. They want to please other people, but they want them to like them. So it's like we do struggle a little bit with vanity, I would say. Um, so even at all the temperaments, everybody of whatever temperament needs to build up their interior life, of course. But sanguines, it may be even a little bit more of a challenge. You know, and we may need it even more to build up that interior life and to make Christ the best friend of our soul. Not to want to please all the other people, but to really please Christ most, most of all. Uh, sanguines need to know when to stop talking and to listen, when to put aside all their activities, when to let others speak up or volunteer. So practicing mental prayer, committing to a regular holy hour, these kinds of things will build up the spiritual life of the sanguine and their relationship with Christ. Now, the beauty and the gift of the sanguine temperament is their effervescent, even childlike love for life, for fun, friends, and social activities. They're generous to a fault, good-hearted, and forgiving. The sanguine's enthusiasm and sociability, when combined with the virtues of perseverance and self-control, and a deep love for Christ, can be tr they can become truly charismatic leaders, like St. Philip Neri, who is a sanguine saint, and they can bring many souls to Christ. Now, the melancholic, the last one. I've let the best for last here, right? <laughs> the melancholic is the exact opposite of the sanguine. So, where the sanguine is outgoing, optimistic, and enthusiastic, the melancholic is cautious, rather pessimistic, they would say realistic, and serious. Where the sanguine reacts quickly, the melancholic reacts slowly, but vehemently. And once the reaction is registered, it becomes very intense. The sanguine is impulsive, and the melancholic is a perfectionist. The sanguine believes in quantity, not necessarily quality, of friends, and the melancholic is very choosy, and one good friend would be enough. But they are friends for life, very persevering. So in terms of the reactions, as I mentioned, the different reactions, so the melancholic's reactions are, are delayed, so they're not, they don't appear on the surface, they're delayed, and then, but then they become more and more vehement as time goes on. So they kind of go seeps into their soul. And then they, it also is very long lasting. So they can be very, very persevering. They're great. It's like once they get started, they're hard to get started on a project, but once they get started, they persevere to the end. Whereas the sanguine will start lots and lots of projects and then drop them. So, <laughs> yeah. So you can identify melancholic children, if you have, you know, those of you who have kids, um, by their intense sensitivity and their deep reactions. Okay, this, one, this really hit home one time. And sometimes parents worry about, you know, if they have a child who has these intense reactions. Um, but this is all normal. And um, we were going, our, when our kids were in high school, our youngest was, she was in Beauty and the Beast. And um, this was a musical, and they were putting on a performance just for little kids. Like this was the matinee performance and it was just for little kids. So my husband arrived late and he gets into the lobby and there's like 20 little kids in the lobby. I mean, there's like hundreds in the, in the auditorium. There's like 20 in the lobby who are all crying, inconsolable. They're just clinging to their parents' legs. And it's like, what happened? Well, the beast had just made his appearance. And the other kids are in there like, yeah, the beast, you know? And, you know, ooh, you know, or whatever. They're loving it because they know, you know. Well, anyway, I mean, it wasn't really a scary beast. It was, this is a, a kid's show. But 
the very, very sensitive ones, they took it very, very seriously. They were, they were terrified of the beast. So they're, and their parents in the situation might have said, like, oh, they're embarrassed, you know, like, why is my kid out here? Why can't he be normal, like, in the, with the rest of the, you know? But no, it's like you want to, you, what you want to do is you want to affirm that it, that is their temperament. That is something, that is God's gift to them. That is how he made them. And that, it, we had to learn that when our, our first child was a melancholic. So, you know, it's like, you know, I used to talk for her all the time. Like, then I realized, wait, <laughs> you know, she may not learn how to talk if I <laughs> don't let her speak sometimes, you know. But, um, <laughs> no, I mean, but they were very, you know, they were very, very uh, quiet, very cautious. Um, Anyway, uh, okay, so where, where the sanguine talks, the melancholic listens. So lots of melancholics, in fact, are, in, are priests and religious. There are very, you know, the great listeners. There's a lot of uh, therapists are, are melancholics as well. A lot of teachers are melancholics. So um, they're, they're much better at listening than the sanguine. Where the sanguine may be emotionally volatile, he will soon forget. But the melancholic will, may not show you her reactions, but she will not forget. So we used to say, you got to be a good parent if you have melancholic children because they're not going to forget that time that they got wrongfully punished when it was really their brother who did the thing. Ooh, they remember that. <laughs> so it is said that the melancholic so longs for heaven that everything on earth falls short. They're idealistic and perfectionistic. As a result, they can be somewhat cautious, as I said about initiating new things. They might say no at first, but then if you have a friend or you work, a co-worker and you're working with a melancholic, you have to give them time. You don't just lay something on them. Let's do this right now. I have this great idea. They're like, no, I don't. Mm, mm, let me think about it. You know, so they don't like that. But you, if you say, hey, I, I think I have an idea. Let's, maybe let's talk about it. You know, I'll let you think about it for a while. Maybe we can talk about it again next week or something like that. You know, so give them more time to think and to process the information. So, where the sanguine is sort of careless and confident and jumps right in, the melancholic can focus a lot on the details and really trying to get everything perfect, foreseeing all the obstacles, thinking about all the what ifs. And sometimes people think, well, the melancholic is being a critical or a naysayer. They're not really, they're just really seeing seeing all the details that other people are not seeing. So they also, and they rarely make an impulsive decision. Okay, going shopping, I go shopping with my melancholic daughter, but it can be torturous because <laughs> we have to examine every item of clothing, do comparison shopping, then we have to check the sales, make sure there's not another sale that looks online, you know, while we check her phone, make sure there's not a better price, and then take things back 10 times, you know, check all the stores before... And we're like, ah, and I'm just like, I just want to buy stuff, you know? <laughs> I'm an impulse shopper, hey, you know? And um, so, but, but really, I take her with me because she really helps me. Like, there's, I can't tell you how many things I've had to, you know, give away because I'm like, ooh, did I buy that? Ooh, ha, embarrassing, you know? So, but if I bring her along, she's much more careful and she has a good eye. They're very artistic. That's another thing. Melancholics are very artistic. Um, so, there, and as I said, they're slow to respond. So my husband, who's the melancholic and phlegmatic, we're exactly opposite. But anyway, it works out okay. <laughs> um, but so our, when our melancholic was an undergrad at Catholic University, um, she actually got a job at working at the fitness center. And, um, and this is great. It's like one of those really easy jobs where, you know, she just sat there kind of at the entryway, and people showed their, you know, their, their ID, and she would say, okay, yeah, looks like there's a treadmill free. Looks like, oh, the elliptical's free. You know, that's all she had to do. She could read, study, and all that kind of stuff. So she'd had the job for about six months, let's say, and um, she gives us a call, and she goes, Mom, you know, I'm really thinking about something. I go, what are you thinking about? She goes, I'm really thinking about working out. <laughs> so she'd been there six months. <laughs> the treadmill right there. <laughs> Elliptical right there. 
and she's thinking about working out. And, I, and we were like, oh, don't rush into that. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> so virtues that can be tough for a melancholic can be, could be the expression of gratitude, um, because sometimes they think it's all in their heads, you know? They're introverted. They're thinking things, but they're not saying things, you know? So, and they also don't think they ought to have to say things like, you know, oh, thank you for, you know, doing such a good job on that whatever they, you, you just did. They think, well, People should just do things because they ought to do things. They don't think that you should have to thank people for it. You know what I mean? Like, but the expression of gratitude is really important. And um, so this is a really helpful tip for melancholics. If, you are, if you're a melancholic, um, you know, learn to just, just practice that. Practice gratitude. And in fact, they found, the researchers um, have actually found that if you practice gratitude, you become more happy. So, of course, the church has always known this, but um, now psychologists know it, too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, gratitude is excellent. Fortitude and charity are, are wonderful virtues to practice if you are a melancholic. Now, fear of venturing out can actually stop the melancholic sometimes. And uh, that's something where you just have to, like, press forward, be not afraid, and go out and do something for somebody else. Like, um, practice charity, that doing something, but not just by yourself. The melancholic is probably happy to go do a holy hour, you know, by themselves, you know, or whatever. But, you know, encourage, if you have a melancholic friend or you're a melancholic, you know, do something that's social. You know, go out, go to the soup kitchen, you know, serve some soup, um, help out at the, um, you know, the baby drive or whatever that you have at your parish, that kind of thing. Do something with a group activity. But the gift of the melancholic is their love for truth, beauty, and justice. They take the noble and true road. They are truly faithful friends. They care about getting things done right. Who are you going to call when you want to have somebody take notes for you in class? Are you going to call the sanguine? It's like, oh, I forgot. Oh, yeah, was there somebody talking? Oh, I was staring out the window. Sorry about that. Um, no, you'll call your melancholic friend who will have taken careful notes. Um, so when, they have, when the melancholic has conquered some of the fears that they might have, and they step outside of themselves, and they're willing to express the gratitude they feel in their hearts, then they become powerful leaders for Christ. And an example of a melancholic saint would be, um, I think, uh, Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. I would put her forward as a potential uh, melancholic saint. So to sum up briefly, I'm going to sum up really briefly, and then I want to let you guys have time to ask questions. So, um, so we discussed the fact that our temperament is a gift from God. It's a significant part, but not the whole, of our personality. Um, it doesn't put us in a box. It just helps us, gives us a way for understanding and accepting ourselves, and also our friends, our family members, our coworkers. It helps us communicate and better express our love for them. Sometimes picking up our cross every day is simply a matter of putting aside our own preferences and learning to communicate in a way that better fosters love and understanding with our, among our family members and our coworkers. So God has given each of us a temperament to start us off, but we're not supposed to stop there, we're supposed to grow in virtue. And in the, uh, in the dialogues of St. Saint Catherine of Siena, um, she asked God why he didn't give people every natural gift, every natural virtue that they needed. And he said, he told her, well, I didn't give you every natural gift, just like we all have little bits of it. We have strengths and weaknesses. He said, so that we would love each other and so that we would appreciate the other person and how they help us. So when you learn the temperaments, you can really understand how, you can see how you can work together as a team. We can all work together to build the body of Christ. As St. Paul tells us, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. Some are choleric, some are phlegmatic, some sanguine, some melancholic. So we don't say, why can't I be more sanguine? Or why can't I be less phlegmatic? But instead, 
we should eagerly desire the greater gifts. And what are the greater gifts? Over all of these, put on love. And of course, that's why you all are here today. And thank you very much. That's my talk. And I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.